Good evening and welcome to Nef's Lair. Tonight I have a very special journey for you, one that has captivated the ancients and continues till this day. We journey to the seven wonders of the ancient world. We will explore the sites and marvel at how they were constructed to a scale that is unbelievable and push the limits of engineering, art, architecture and sculpture where it still astounds us to this day. If you enjoy the content I am creating, please consider subscribing for future adventures and your thoughts and comments are always welcome below. Let me know which adventures you are waiting for. Before we begin our journey, please adjust yourself to a position that you are comfortable in. Release the tension that is built up in your neck and shoulders. Let go of stress and invite relaxation. Take a deep breath in, holding it before you release. As you are settling in and experiencing comfort, let my voice start to take over and be your guide. Around 225 BC, a Greek engineer, Philo, produced a list of seven tomata, things to be seen, that are better known today as the seven wonders of the ancient world. The pyramids at Giza, the statue of Zeus at Olympia, the temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the mausoleum at Halicarnassus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Pharos of Alexandria, and most mysterious of all, the hanging gardens of Babylon. One of them is still standing, five have been destroyed, either by man or nature, and the last one remains an enigma. Our journey begins along the fertile west bank of the Nile River in ancient Egypt. The Great Pyramid of Giza, situated southwest of modern Cairo, is the only one of the wonders still mostly intact today. It is also the first of the seven ancient wonders to be built and stands as testament to its exquisite construction that still survives to this day. Built in 2500 BC for the fourth dynasty Pharaoh Khufu as a tomb that would help the passage for the Pharaoh to the afterlife. Built on the massive Giza Plateau, which is the site for a vast pyramid complex. It is the largest of the pyramids, towering over the estimated 80 others to a height of over 140 meters. It inspired fear and respect in life as in death. The pharaoh was laid to rest in a granite sarcophagus deep inside the pyramid in the king's chamber. The Great Pyramid is still the largest stone structure in the world today. The architect believed to design the pyramid was Hemon, who was also the vizier of Khufu. The ancient Greek historian Herodotus in the 5th century BC is one of the first major authors to mention the pyramid. This is 2000 years after the pyramids were built and thus the information came from indirect sources such as local priests, low-ranking officials or Egyptian citizens and thus his account is incomplete, unreliable and filled with inaccuracies. This leaves us 
with the mystery of how the ancient Egyptians were able to build it so long ago without iron tools or machinery. Herodotus claimed that they were built by 100,000 slaves in three-month shifts over 20 years. He also claims that Khufu was a tyrannical king. As to the view of the ancient Greeks, such extraordinary buildings can only come through the exploitation of its people. This view was exaggerated throughout history and later popularized by Hollywood. Later evidence, however, shows that they were built by specialized workers and farmers during the off-season when the Nile was flooded annually. They saw it as a national service, akin to having been conscripted to the army. It was their duty to their nation. As to the Egyptians, the pharaohs were the living embodiment of gods on earth. It was also a source of income and food for the workers when the Nile was flooded, as naturally farmers could not plant and provide work to others. Evidence of this was excavated in the workers' villages surrounding the pyramids, sometimes called the lost city of the pyramid builders. In the cemeteries discovered by researchers, they found large areas for slaughterhouses and piles of animal bones. This indicates that the builders were given a nutritious protein diet, as one would imagine, as pyramid building is needless to say, physically hard work. They also show evidence of workers with healed bones, thus indicating medical treatment was given. Both these factors of a meat-rich diet and medical care would have been attractive and additional lure to work on the pyramids. The Great Pyramid was built with over 2.3 million stone and granite blocks, with the outside casing made of white limestone. Most of the stones were quarried just south of Giza, in an area known as the Central Field. The site of Giza was chosen because of the abundance of quality limestone in the surrounding areas. The total weight of the pyramids was over 6 million ton. The Egyptians were experienced pyramid builders. To achieve this feat, the Egyptians had to have a well streamlined and highly efficient operation. Current accounts estimate that only 20,000 workers were used instead of the 100,000 in the account of Herodotus. The large stone blocks were pulled on ledges from the quarry by the laborers, one by one, and put into place. Each team of laborers pulling the block had a person standing on it, clapping in rhythm to ensure that each laborer pulled at the same time. Starting from the largest at the bottom, weighing over five ton, the Egyptians had reached such efficiency that they could place a block every two minutes. But even with such efficiency, it still took 23 years to complete with a disciplined workforce. Another one of the great architectural achievements of the pyramid is its alignment with the four cardinal points, which is almost perfect. Even more astounding is how they had only rope and geometry to create a perfect square for the base. After finding the exact location they want to construct the pyramid, 
they cut into the rock below to form the base. Then, each block was placed, one after the other. As the pyramid grew taller, they formed a girdle that would spiral around the pyramid from mud and rubble, on which they could pull the stones on the ramp higher and higher. Additional theories also suggest that the ramp was straight. Instead of snaking around the pyramid, the ramp was gradually extended as the pyramid was built. They cite the difficulty of pulling the blocks around the corners of the pyramid, as well as the tremendous weight load it would put on a spiral ramp. For this to be the case, the straight ramp had to be almost two kilometers long and had to continuously be adjusted in terms of length and gradient. Both theories for the ramp had their difficulties and still baffles us today as to how it was done. The builders only used the most basic of tools to achieve this monument with access only to stone and copper tools. To such a high degree of precision, it stood as the tallest man-made structure for thousands of years until the construction of the old St. Paul's Cathedral in 1221 in London, England. When the pyramid was completed, they cased it in top quality limestone to start smoothing the stepped appearance. They did this from top to bottom, gradually removing the ramp as they went lower. The pyramids have shown how endearing they are by outlasting all the other ancient wonders and their design has inspired many and produced many copies around the world. One of the most iconic is the glass pyramid at the Louvre in Paris, designed by American architect I. M. Pei. According to him, the stone pyramids represent and honor the dead, while the transparent glass of his pyramid is meant to represent the living. Khufu's great pyramid has always sparked awe in travelers and invoked the questions, how they were built, who built them. When the Arabs arrived in the 9th century AD and looked upon the majesty and immortality of the pyramids, they said that man fears time, and time fears the pyramids. It would pave the way for the other six wonders and stood for 2,000 years before the next ancient wonder was built. We travel to the east, where the second of the ancient wonders were built, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. The location and fate of the Hanging Gardens are unknown, and there is speculation that they may have never existed at all. According to ancient Greek poets, the gardens were built in 600 BC by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II, next to the Euphrates River in modern-day Iraq. The gardens were said to have been planted as high as 23 meters in the air on a huge square brick terrace. They are described by the ancient writer Diodorus Siculus as being self-watering plains of exotic flora and fauna on a series of climbing terraces. He noted that the terraces sloped upwards like an ancient theatre and that they were built on pillars lined with reeds and bricks. According to Diodorus, the king allegedly built the towering gardens as a gift for his queen Amethyst, 
who was homesick for the natural beauty of her home in Media, the northwestern part of modern-day Iran. Later, writers described how people could walk underneath the beautiful gardens, which rested on tall stone columns. Strabo, the Greek geographer and historian, describes the location of the gardens as by the Euphrates, which ran through the ancient Babylon, and the complicated machinery of screws which drew water up from the river to water the gardens. He also mentions the presence of stairs to reach the various levels. The screws mentioned are none other than the Archimedes screw, who designed it when watching ancient Egyptians pump water from the Nile. However, Archimedes lived 200 years after the gardens existed, and thus his screw could not have been used. Modern scientists have deduced that for the gardens to survive, they would have had to be irrigated using a system consisting of a pump, a water wheel and cisterns to carry water from the Euphrates many feet into the air. One device that existed performed exactly this purpose, the Shadoof, and was most likely used to irrigate the gardens. Though there are multiple accounts of the gardens in both Greek and Roman literature, none of them are first hand, and no mention of the gardens has been found in Babylonian cuneiform inscriptions. The fact that Herodotus, mentioned earlier in our story, never mentioned them in his descriptions of Babylon, are also fueled to the controversy. He wrote about the impressive irrigation system of Babylon and the walls of Babylon, but does not mention any gardens. In the same breath, he also never mentioned the Sphinx when visiting Giza. We saw that he was wrong about the pyramids and, in other writings, failed to mention important facts, figures or places. However, the historian Diodorus, Philo and the geographer Strabo all claim the gardens existed. Some scholars claim the gardens were actually at Nineveh, capital of the Assyrian Empire. Some stick with the ancient writers and await archaeology to provide positive proof. And still, Others believe they are merely a figment of the ancient imagination. As a result, most modern scholars believe that the existence of the gardens was part of an inspired and widely believed but still fictional tale. Archaeology at Babylon itself and ancient Babylonian texts are silent on the matter but ancient writers described the gardens as if they were at Nebuchadnezzar's capital and still in existence in Hellenistic times. The exotic nature of the gardens, compared to the more familiar Greek items on the list, which we will explore later, and the mystery surrounding their location and disappearance, have made the hanging gardens of Babylon the most captivating of all the seven wonders. The majority of scholars agree that the idea of cultivating gardens purely for pleasure, as opposed to the production of food, originated in the fertile crescent, where they were known as a paradise. From there, the notion would spread throughout the ancient Mediterranean so that by Hellenistic times, even private individuals, or at least the wealthier ones, were cultivating their own private gardens in their homes. Gardens were not just about flowers and plants, either, as architectural 
sculptural and water features were added, and even the views were a consideration for the ancient landscape gardener. Gardens became such a desired feature that fresco painters, such as those at Pompeii, covered entire walls of villas with scenes which gave the illusion that on entering a room one was also entering a garden. All of these outdoor pleasant places then owed their existence to ancient Mesopotamia and, above all, to the magnificent hanging gardens of Babylon. The first mention in an ancient source of the gardens is by Barossus, a priest from Babylon. Writing in 290 BC, Barossus's work survives only as quoted excerpts in that of later writers, but many of his descriptions of Babylon have been corroborated by archaeology. Barossus describes high stone terraces which imitated mountains and which were planted with many types of large trees and flowers. Terraces would not only have created the pleasant aesthetic effect of hanging vegetation, but also made their irrigation easier. The reason the gardens would captivate travelers to Babylon is the environment in which it was built. The region was dry and arid, making it difficult for trees and plants to survive without proper irrigation. There are known precedents for large gardens in Mesopotamia which predate those said to have been at Babylon. There are even depictions of them, for example, on a relief panel from the North Palace of Ashurbanipal at Nineveh. Indeed, some scholars suggest that the whole Babylonian gardens idea is the result of a monumental mix-up, and it is Nineveh which actually had the fabled wonder, built there by Sennacherib. There is ample textual and archaeological evidence of gardens at Nineveh, and the city was sometimes even referred to as Old Babylon. In any case, even if the hypothesis of Nineveh is accepted, it still does not preclude the possibility of gardens at Babylon. There were also gardens after the supposed date of the hanging gardens of Babylon. Those at Basar Gadei in the Zagros Mountains, built by Cyrus the Great in 530 BC, for example. All such gardens usually had terraces to aid irrigation, high walls to provide shade. Trees were clustered together so as to better maintain their vital moisture and withstand scorching winds and, of course, all were located near an abundant water source. That gardens were commonly associated with palaces in just about every culture from ancient China to Mesoamerica has led some scholars to speculate that the gardens at Babylon, if they did exist, would also have been near or in one of the royal palaces of Nebuchadnezzar on the banks of the river Euphrates. It is likely that the gardens were destroyed within a century of its construction, as the city of Babylon was burnt and destroyed by the Persian king Xerxes. It is difficult to imagine the plant survived this ordeal, having already been pushed to the limits of their existence in the gardens. Despite its short lifespan, the gardens have gained legendary status. They remain unique among the ancient wonders as the only one to display nature's beauty and live on as the most famous gardens ever. The third of the ancient wonders to be built 
takes us to Asia Minor, to the largest marble temple ever built, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, at the time the wealthiest city in the region and the largest port in the Aegean, situated near the modern-day town of Seljuk in Turkey. The temple was dedicated to the goddess Artemis, the Greek mother god, also known as the Greek goddess of the hunt. Many people have their own opinion on which of the seven wonders were the most magnificent of them all, but few were more certain than Antipater of Sidon. His tribute to the temple of Artemis read, I have set eyes on the wall of lofty Babylon, on which is a road for chariots, and the statue of Zeus by the Alpheus, and the hanging gardens, and the colossus of the sun, and the huge labor of the high pyramid, and the vast tomb of Mausolus. But when I saw the house of Artemis, that mounted to the clouds. Those other marvels lost their brilliancy, and I said, Lo, apart from Olympus, the sun never looked on aught so grand. Sponsored by the wealthy king Croesus of Lydia in 550 BC, according to Herodotus, among others, the temple was so magnificent that every account of it is written with the same tone of awe, and each agrees with the other that this was among the most amazing structures ever raised by humans. The temple was destroyed and rebuilt many times. The original temple of Artemis was designed by the Cretan architect Chersiphron and his son Metagenes and decorated by some of the most celebrated artists of the ancient world. Although he was a celebrated architect of his time, this was to be on a scale never before attempted by Greek architecture. He may have visited the temples of Thebes in Egypt in his travels, and be inspired by the many columns that formed part of the temples, Designed to be entirely of marble, it had 126 giant columns. The first challenge was to ensure a large supply of enormous blocks of marble. These blocks could weigh as much as 40 ton and were quarried from a site 11 kilometers away. The difficulty in moving the stones must have been immense and there has been much controversy over how the ancients did it. Chersiphron invented an ingenious method by which a roller was pulled by an oxen. He would encase the blocks in wood to form a wheel and attach a wooden framework around it. These could then be used to transport the enormous blocks, including the largest of the architraves, which was nine meters high and the peripteral columns, which were 18 meters tall. The temple was 137 meters long and 69 meters wide, almost twice the size of the Parthenon. It was surrounded by a double row of columns, topped with huge lintels. The difficulty in lifting the lintels above the peripteral columns posed an enormous challenge. They used cantilever cranes to lift the enormous blocks, which in those days were only used in transportation of water or goods from ships in the docks. Their innovation and once again willingness to push engineering brought us the crane, which is still used to build our modern skyscrapers to this day. Having access to iron tools, it allowed the artists to sculpt and decorate the columns and lintels, but also meant that more care had to be put in their transportation and placement. The lintels had to be placed at exactly the right positions 
or the whole temple would crumble to the ground. It is said Cursifron contemplated suicide when faced with placing the final lintel. A similar problem faced the ancient Egyptians when placing the sarcophagus of the pharaoh 60 meters down a shaft into the king's chamber. Their technique was simple. They filled the shaft with sand and excavated the side shaft, slowly removing the sand and making the sarcophagus lower to its resting place. Cursophron adapted this technology to solve his problem. He stacked large sacks of sand in a mound around the structure and put the architrave on top of the mound. By slowly cutting the sacks open and letting the sand out, they could manipulate the blocks and put them in place with extreme precision. The temple took 50 years to complete and Cursophron never saw its completion. His son, Mitigenes, took over to complete the construction. The building burned on July 21st, 356 BC. According to legend, the same night that Alexander the Great was born. It was destroyed by a vainglorious act of arson by a Greek citizen named Herostratus, who claimed he burned the marvel so that his name would be known to history. He was put to death and the government declared it illegal to utter his name. Plutarch remarked that Artemis herself was too preoccupied with Alexander's delivery to save her burning temple. Within three decades, the temple was reconstructed in 323 BC. By that time, Alexander had conquered every country around the eastern Mediterranean and even offered to pay for the building's reconstruction. However, the Ephesians tactfully refused stating, it would be improper for one god to build a temple to another. It was eventually plundered and partially destroyed by the Goths when they invaded the Aegean in 262 AD and was never rebuilt. Its final destruction came about in 401 AD when a Christian mob led by St. John Chrysostom stormed it. Inspired by the decree of the Roman Emperor Theodosius I against pagan practices. The temple of Artemis was not forgotten and a tradition sprang up in medieval times that some of the columns of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople were looted from it. The fourth wonder takes us to the small town of Olympia in Elise on the Peloponnese Peninsula in Greece. Despite its name, it is nowhere near Mount Olympus, home of the gods in Greek mythology. However, it was the site of the famed statue of Zeus, the king of the gods. It was crafted by the Athenian sculptor Phidias and completed and placed in the temple of Zeus at Olympia site of the ancient Olympics, around 435 BC. Phidias was considered to be the finest sculptor of his age, having also worked on the Parthenon and the statue of Athena in Athens. After the Greek defeat of the Persian armies, they were rich with the spoils of war. Pericles rose to power and commissioned many monuments around Greece to commemorate the victory. One of those was the Parthenon in Athens, which was decorated with lavish friezes using the bas-relief technique, making the sculpted figures rise slowly from the background, the most famous of which are the Algon marbles. He was so impressed with the work of Phidias that he made him the chief designer. 
he could be considered the Michelangelo of the Greek age. He was asked to make a statue of the goddess Athena to stand inside the Parthenon. Crafted from ivory and gold, he designed it to stand 12 meters tall. Statues and monuments were being commissioned at high rates during those times, and artistic rivalry came to the scene. He was determined that his statue of Athena would outshine every other statue in Greece. He ultimately met this challenge, and after its completion, was heralded as a genius. Soon, he would be in high demand, as virtually every other town in Greece wanted such a statue, and, as word reached Olympia, they commissioned him to make a statue of Zeus. Olympia, site of the ancient Olympic Games, was towered over by the Temple of Olympus. The statue was commissioned to be placed inside the temple, as the statue of Athena had been in the Parthenon. The games were held in honor of Zeus, and even ceased wars when they were held. Arriving at Olympia, visitors beheld a walled enclave where a trio of Doric temples, 70 altars, and hundreds of statues of past Olympic victors created a dazzling sculpture garden. The most impressive of the structures was the Temple of Zeus, built between 466 and 456 BC and resembling the Parthenon in Athens. Until Phidias, ivory carving had only been used on a small scale. The design was too large to be carved out of solid ivory blocks, so a new technique had to be developed, a technique that has never been surpassed. He developed a secret method of softening the ivory of which only a few ancient recipes survive. Modern researchers tried to duplicate some of the fantastical recipes. One mentioned that the ivory be wrapped in fishkin, one to soak the ivory in oil, and another to boil the ivory for three days in mandrake root. None were successful until they tried a recipe that said to soak the ivory in vinegar, which produced result. The calcium from the ivory would leak into the vinegar and soften it, making it flexible to be used in sculpting by molding it into shape and drying out in the sun. Phidias and his assistants used this technique of softening the ivory and sculpting many smaller molds and sections, which would fit into each other perfectly. Phidias's workshop was discovered at Olympia in 1954. The rectangular workshop was built of shell limestone and had the same dimensions as the cella of the Temple of Zeus, which allowed the artist better to judge the appearance of the statue in its setting. The statue depicted the god of thunder seated bare-chested at a wooden throne. Holding up the throne's armrests were two carved sphinxes, mythical creatures with the head and chest of a woman, the body of a lion, and the wings of a bird. The statue of Zeus was richly decorated with gold and ivory. The god of thunder held a statue of Nike, the goddess of victory, in his outstretched right hand, and a scepter with an eagle perched on top in his left. At twelve meters, it was so tall that its head nearly touched the top of the temple. Designed to inspire awe in the worshippers who came to the temple of Zeus at Olympia, not everyone was awestruck by the statue, however. The Greek historian Strabo wrote this about the statue. 
although the temple is very large. The sculptor is criticized for not having appreciated the correct proportions. He has shown Zeus seated, but with the head almost touching the ceiling, so that we have the impression that if Zeus moved to stand up, he would unroof the temple. The sculptor had captured both Zeus's invincible divinity and his humanity. Roman general Aemilius Paulus, an earlier visitor, was moved to his soul as if he had beheld the God in person, while the Greek orator Dio Chrysostom wrote that a single glimpse of the statue would make a man forget his earthly troubles. According to legend, the sculptor Phidias asked Zeus for a sign of his approval after finishing the statue. Soon after, the temple was struck by lightning. The Zeus statue graced the temple at Olympia for more than eight centuries, even surviving Roman Emperor Caligula, who wanted it brought to Rome so that its head could be replaced with its own likeness. Legend has it, that the statue let out such a loud cackle of laughter that the scaffolding collapsed and the workmen fled. Eventually, Christian priests persuaded the Roman Emperor Theodosius II to close the temple in the 4th century AD. The ban on pagan rites also halted the Olympic Games. The fate of the statue is unknown. It may have been taken to Constantinople, where it was probably destroyed in the fire of 475 AD, or it may have been destroyed in the fire at Olympia in 426 AD. The fifth wonder is located in what is now southeastern Turkey, the mausoleum at Halicarnassus. It was a tomb built by Artemisia for her husband, a Persian satrap Mausolus, the Anatolian king of Caria in Asia Minor, after his death in 353 BC. Mausolus chose Halicarnassus as his capital, and he and his beloved wife and sister, Artemisia, went to great lengths to create a city whose beauty would be unmatched in the world. Made of white marble, the monumental structure sat on a hill overlooking the capital he had built. During his reign, he was known as a fierce protector of his people. The ruins of a grand defensive wall and the Mendes Gate is all that remains of the 11 kilometers wall that surrounded the city. It is also here that the father of history, Herodotus, was born. He also built a large navy of more than 100 ships and, in the Persian style, had a fortress palace believed to be in the place where the current castle of Bodrum stands. The Persians had a tradition of building tombs and he followed the example of the Persian king Cyrus the Great, but his tomb was to be much grander. The massive mausoleum was made entirely of white marble and it is thought to have been about 41 meters high, rising into the air like a gigantic wedding cake above the turquoise harbor of Halicarnassus. It had been designed by Greek architects Pythias and Satyros and boasted three levels, combining Lycian, Greek and Egyptian architectural styles. The building's complicated design, consisting of three rectangular layers, may have been an attempt to reconcile Lycian, Greek and Egyptian architectural styles. The first layer, 
was a 20 meter base of steps that led to the second level, which had a middle layer of 36 ionic columns and a stepped pyramid shaped roof. At the very top of the roof lay the tomb, decorated by the work of four sculptors and a six meter marble rendition of a four horse chariot. This feat of placing a large statue on top of the roof had never been attempted before. Leucarus, Bryaxis, Scopos of Paros, and Timotheus, four of Greece's most renowned artists, created other sculptures and friezes to surround the tomb, each decorating a single side. The sculptors on the north were created by Scopas, the ones on the east, Braxis, on the south, Timotheus, and on the west, Leocaris. Its style has been copied around the world, from the Freemasons Lodge in Washington to the Shrine of Remembrance in Melbourne, Australia. The site of the tomb presented some challenges to the builders due to the scale of the tomb. It required foundations to be dug to the depth of six meters, which soon flooded. Having drained the foundations, Pythus stabilized and strengthened the masonry by joining them together with iron clamps or dovetails. Dowels were fitted between the courses. To assemble the columns, they cut a hole in the base of a column and fit in iron connecting bars that would slot onto the next section, a technique still used to this day. The sculpture surrounding the mausoleum was a large part of why it became so wondrous for travelers. They were twice life-sized and stood on the ledges of the building looking over the city. They depicted men, women, animals, gods, heroes, and the grandest of them all on top of the roof the statue of Mausolus and Artemisia in a quadriga, a chariot that is drawn by four horses. This revolutionary idea of placing a statue on top of a building has been copied since, in triumphal arches and monuments around the world, such as the Arc de Triomphe in Paris, commemorating all those who fought and died for France in the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, or the Wellington Arch that forms a central piece of Hyde Park in London. Mausolus never saw the completion of his tomb. After his death, he was interred in the mausoleum. Artemisia became queen, and her rise to power was unprecedented in the Western world. She took over construction and ensured its completion. During her short reign, she defeated the fleet of Rhodes, who decided to attack Halicarnassus after the death of Mausolus, thinking they could easily overthrow a feeble woman. She managed to outwit them and captured them and then returned to Rhodes with the Halicarnassian fleet and captured Rhodes. It led to the Persian king Xerxes, saying that all his men had become women, and his women became men. According to legend, she was so grief-stricken at his passing that she mixed his ashes with water and drank him. Her decline was so tragic that it was later romanticized by Renaissance artists. Artemisia died two years after Mausolus, and her ashes were entombed with him in the mausoleum. Pliny the Elder records that the craftsmen continued work on the structure after her death. 
both as a tribute to their patroness and knowing that the work would bring them lasting fame. It remained an object of admiration until it was destroyed by a series of earthquakes in medieval times and lay in ruins for hundreds of years until, in 1494 AD, it was completely dismantled and used by the Knights of St. John of Malta in the building of their castle at Bodrum, where the ancient stones can still be seen today. Such was the splendor of Moselis's final resting place that his name led to the word Mausoleum. In 1846, pieces of one of the mausoleum's friezes were extracted from the castle and now reside, along with other relics from the Halicarnassus site, in London's British Museum. Sailing south to Egypt, we reach the port of Alexandria, founded by Alexander the Great, the world's first metropolis. Standing at the head of the Nile, it rivaled ancient Rome in size and power. It was a central trading node in the Mediterranean, with people and goods traveling as far as India. Naturally, most of the goods came by sea. However, the Nile Delta was known for its treacherous coastline, whose submerged rocks and shallow waters had sunk many ships. It was there that the sixth and the only practical ancient wonder was built, the Pharos, or lighthouse, of Alexandria, whose orange flame guided ships to safe harbor. The world's first and most famous lighthouse of the ancient world. It was also the world's first skyscraper, towering at 134 meters. Built for Ptolemy II of Egypt about 285 BC on the island of Pharos, off Alexandria. It was not only built for its utilitarian use, it was to showcase the grandeur of the Ptolemaic dynasty, kings of Egypt at the time, and to showcase the grandeur of Alexandria. Designed by the Greek architect Sostratus, it took 12 years to build. On top was a raging furnace that blasted its golden light over 50 kilometers out to sea. Its light source was a mirror made of bronze. At day, it would reflect the sun's rays, and at night, the fire from the vast furnace that was kept ablaze. There have been some reports found that mention the mirrors being used as lasers to burn enemy ships at sea, much like a magnifying glass would. Towering over the Mediterranean coast for more than 1,500 years and looming above Alexandria's busy eastern harbor, it was surrounded by palm trees and statues of the pharaohs. The 134-meter, three-tiered limestone tower was taller than the Statue of Liberty. Greek poet Posidippus described the site, this tower, in a straight and upright line, appears to cleave the sky from countless stadiums away. Throughout the night, a sail on the waves will see a great fire blazing from its summit. Archaeologists have found ancient coins on which the lighthouse was depicted, and from them deduced that the tower rose from a square base into an octagonal midsection and a cylindrical upper section, all connected by a spiral ramp so that the fire could be lit at the top. 
it was believed the ramp was used by donkeys to carry the fuel needed to keep the fire satisfied. Above that stood a 16-foot statue, most likely of Ptolemy II or Alexander the Great, for whom the city was named. There has been much speculation as to what the ancients used as fuel to feed the fires for the lighthouse. Seeing as Egypt did not have a lot of trees or wood, however, it was the largest port in the Greek world, and it would be safe to assume they had access to lots of raw materials to use as fuel. Some have also suggested various fuels that were readily available, ranging from wood and oil to fats and tree resins. The lighthouse was built mostly of solid blocks of limestone and granite. Strabo reported that Sostratus had a dedication to the savior gods inscribed in metal letters on the lighthouse. Unlike tall buildings of today, it had to bear all of the weight of the structure on its walls. Therefore, the walls had to be extremely thick to reach the height they wanted. It is one of the better documented of the Seven Wonders. At the end of the classical era, it ceased to be a lighthouse, but went on to be a mosque when the Arabs conquered Egypt. They converted the furnace area at the top into a mosque, and there are many accounts of Arab historians who had climbed it and gave very detailed information of its dimensions. The lighthouse was gradually destroyed during a series of earthquakes from 1956 to 1303 AD. Some of its remains have since been discovered at the bottom of the Nile. It managed to survive several major shocks, but not without heavy damage that led to it being abandoned. The ruins collapsed for good in the 15th century. Today, the Egyptian fort Kebei stands on the site of the pharaohs, built with some of the stones from the ruins of the lighthouse. For 700 years, its remains lay on the seabed until French archaeologists discovered massive stones in the waters around Pharos in 1994, which they claim formed part of the ancient structure. French marine biologist Jean-Yves Emperor has been excavating the site for years and has been documenting the many thousands of blocks in and around the harbour, deciphering how it was built. In 2015, Egyptian authorities announced their intention to rebuild the wonder. Our last stop is on the Greek island of Rhodes, in the southern Aegean and eastern Mediterranean. Following the death of Alexander, his generals vied for control of his empire. In the famous wars of the Diadochi, three succeeded in dividing the kingdom among themselves, Ptolemy, Seleucus, and Antigonus. Rhodes formed strong commercial and cultural ties with the Ptolemies in Alexandria, and together formed the Rhodo-Egyptian alliance that controlled trade throughout the Aegean in the 3rd century BC. However, this outraged the Antigonids from Asia Minor and they attacked Rhodes with a huge fleet by Demetrius. Against all odds, the Rhodians were victorious. In honor of their victory, they built the last of the seven world wonders, a giant bronze colossus to their savior, the sun god Helios. There were many bronze statues in the city of Rhodes, 
but the Colossus was easily the largest. The statue was commissioned after the defeat of the invading army of Demetrius. Demetrius left behind much of his siege equipment and weaponry, and this was sold by the Rhodians for 300 talents, approximately 360 million US dollars. The money they received was used to build the Colossus. Designed by the sculptor Chares, who was one of the many talented bronze sculptors on the island of Rhodes. Some stories say that his initial design for the statue was about 18 meters high, but the islanders insisted on a statue that was almost twice that size. The challenging part was that no other bronze statue of this size had been attempted. The statue had to be manufactured and sculpted on site. Casting most likely happened right next to the statue, in pits, and the pieces riveted together to fit into place. They were placed around a framework of wood and iron. Keeping the statue stable posed another problem, and they dropped stones down the ankles into the feet to add weight to the base. As the Colossus grew taller, they needed higher and higher access. Chare's solution was to place lots of sand and rubble in a spiral around the statue, allowing workmen to reach the top, much like the girdle used for the Great Pyramid. This, however, made it so that the finished statue could only be seen when the work was done and the earth removed, making it difficult to judge various stages of the process in constructing the Colossus. Especially since, if there had been some error, it would not be able to easily take it apart again and reassemble. 225 tons of bronze was used in its construction, and when completed, it stood just over 33 meters high, overlooking the harbor of Rhodes, and, despite many depictions of its legs straddling the harbor, to the contrary, stood with its legs together on a base much like the Statue of Liberty in the harbor of New York City in the United States, which is modeled on the Colossus. As time went on after the destruction of the statue, people forgot how the statue once stood, and it wasn't until the Renaissance, when Martin van Heemskerk portrayed the wonders for the first time. In his version, he depicted it astride the harbor, which, as mentioned earlier, is impossible. The Titan of Bravos in George R. R. Martin's series of A Song of Ice and Fire was inspired by the Colossus of Rhodes, and in his books, his Titan is also depicted astride the harbor of Bravos, guarding its entrance. The statue stood for only 56 years before it was destroyed. Much like the Mausoleum of Mausolus, and the lighthouse of Alexandria by an earthquake in 226 BC. It was the last wonder to be built and the first to be destroyed. As such, all seven wonders existed at the same time for a period of less than 60 years. Rhodians declined Ptolemy's offer to have it rebuilt having been told by an oracle that they had offended Helios, and that Rhodes would suffer a great misfortune if they rebuilt it. So the giant, broken sections lay on the ground, where they stayed for over 800 years, still attracting visitors. The historian Pliny the Elder wrote, Even as it lies, it excites our wonder and admiration. Few people can clasp the thumb in their arms, 
and its fingers are larger than most statues. When enemy forces finally sold the Colossus for scrap in the 7th century, it took 900 camel loads to shift all the pieces. Because of this, archaeologists do not know much about the exact location of the statue or what it looked like. While not even a drawing of the statue survives, scholars theorize the Colossus was an upright figure holding a torch aloft in one hand. Helios's face was quite possibly modeled after Alexander the Great's. Today's architectural wonders stand within the safeguards of science and technology. The seven wonders have become icons of the ancient world. They stood not solely by the laws of science, but by the will of an age determined to build the impossible. Architecture, art and sculpture continue to pay a debt to the excellence of their construction. Thank you once again for joining me tonight. I hope the experience was educational, entertaining and relaxing. Thank you.